Um, I'm really happy to be here to give the uh, uh, tutorial. Uh, I think that these kind of workshops are enormously important and valuable, and I, I've heard that this year you've had a, a hands-on uh, set of modules, and I think that's particularly uh, exciting for those of you who are just getting involved in the area. Uh, my background is uh, as a chemist, as Steve has uh, indicated. Um, we work very closely with those involved in instrumentation and, uh, and particularly in the imaging area. So uh, we find this to be very complementary and, uh, and also gives us rise to new ideas about why we should be making certain kinds of particles. So for today, I'm going to uh, uh, focus on what we're called plasmon resonant nanoparticles. Okay, so this will mostly uh, constitute gold. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about silver, uh, but uh, I'd like to first go into the definition of what plasmon is and talk a little bit about physical principles and then get on to some of the applications and some of the chemistry that uh, might be important if you ever decide to use gold or silver particles for uh, various forms of uh, biophotonic uh, applications. Um, so uh, I think I have 50 minutes, 60 minutes, 50 minutes. So, um, so in the beginning, I'll tend to go a little bit slower, but most of the exciting applications are near the end. So uh, please don't let me get bogged down in the details. Okay, but I'll be happy to try to answer any questions along the way. All right, so, so here's the outline of our, of our talk. Okay, so, so, uh, so again, we'll cover some of the basic uh, physical uh, concepts that uh, underlie what plasmons are. It is actually a rather confusing area. There's a multiple uh, variants on what a plasmon is, and so we'll narrow the definition for the purposes of our of our uh, tutorial today. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about surface chemistry. Right, that's really just the enabling part to allow gold particles and so on to be used in biophotonic applications. And then I'll talk about some of the applications themselves, right? There are different modalities that can be involved. And uh, particularly, I would like to focus on the biological in vitro and in vivo uh, techniques. If there's time left over, we'll talk about theranostics, which is really the combination of using imaging applied toward something that may have therapeutic benefit, okay? And that's really kind of the, uh, uh, the, the catch word of many people involved in cancer nanotechnology today. Okay, oh, uh, since I'll be glossing over some of the details, I just want to point out that I have two references, two book chapters that are, uh, can be worth your while if you want to go more into the details. Uh, this first one uh, is a, a really good place to start. It doesn't get too physical, but really just surveys the literature at the time where gold particles have been applied in, in myriad applications. Okay, so, so this is a, a link that you should be able to download a PDF. And this one really covers anything that I don't talk about in terms of the physical concepts of plasmons and, and how they apply to the shape and size and structure of, of metal nanoparticles. Okay, so the definition we're going to use today on surface plasmons, which abbreviates SP, is that uh, this is defined by many people as a collective excitation of conduction electrons, free electrons, using light at a, at a resonant frequency. And usually that light's in the visible to near IR range. Okay? Now, there are growing, there are, this is a dynamic concept. There are actually new forms of plasmons coming out, and uh, you know, we're not going to talk about those. So this is more or less a classic definition of what a surface plasmon is. Um, so you've seen examples earlier today from Dr. Bobert's talk that, uh, that materials such as magnetic particles or tissues uh, scatter light, okay? And this is a general uh, phenomenon, right? Just about everything will scatter light and the bigger the structure, the more light that you'll scatter, okay? So that's a, that's a very basic uh, 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 type of interaction with light. So the difference with plasmon resonant particles is that they can be resonant at particular frequencies. And so since we like to do imaging often in the near, uh, near infrared or the far red region, we try to tune particles so that they have a high degree of excitation uh, in those uh, frequency ranges, okay? Actually, I'll be using wavelengths for most of the day, but I'll interchangeably say frequency and wavelength during the hour. All right, so this is the, uh, uh, um, the cartoon form, a very uh, crude cartoon, in fact, of how plasma resonance works. So if you take that as a gold particle, um, and there's an instant beam of light, a photon hits the particle at a particular frequency, the conduction electrons in the gold will resonate up and down at that particular frequency, okay? So again, it's a resonant condition that will go out. And in most of the time, that, that light will then be, the photon energy will be re-emitted, okay? And if it's re-emitted without any change, that's just basically a scattering, right? So the lambda of scattering is the same as the instant light, but there actually can be modification if we have inelastic scattering or even multi-photon excitation processes. Okay, so, so this light scattering, this resin light scattering from nanoparticles has been known for a very long time. And, and so if anyone has ever done dark field imaging, uh, you'll uh, recognize that it's actually quite easy to see single gold particles if they're large enough. So here's just a, a dark field image 
of gold particles that have been scattered on a glass slide. This has been coupled through some sort of evanescence wave where the light actually is, is going underneath the sample, but then the nanoparticle can couple the light underneath, and you can see these, you can see the positions of where they are at. Okay, so, so this has been known for a good long time, particularly useful for you know, various forms of uh, dark field microscopy and of course for OCT and any kind of imaging that requires either absorption or scattering as part of their uh, 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 contrast generation. Now, uh, and uh, so of course, uh, uh, I'd like to show this image here, which is just a, that one of the earliest examples you'll find of nanotechnology. So this is back in the, the Roman days. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a, the Lycurgus cup, which is generated uh, for uh, one of the uh, earlier kings, uh, or, or the, I should say the late Roman empires, which then became uh, um, a, king, uh, uh, a realm of the kingdom. And, and these are glass cups that are impregnated with gold particles in them, okay? And so the reason for showing this is that depending on how you view the cup, right, your, you know, with respect to your own visual direction, right? The, the cup can appear red or can appear green. Okay? And it's not that a cup is changing color, at least not in, the, in our sense that we're changing anything chemically about this, but rather it's how the light interacts with the particle with respect to your eye. So in this case, the light is shining from the back, and so the particles are extinguishing the light. So you're, you're absorbing the light, and what you're left with is the red wavelength so that you see. Okay? But if you shine the light from the front, right, and it reflects or scatters off the surface, then it'll appear green. Okay? And so this is something that is actually very easy for beginners, at least, to get confused, that you see different colors and therefore the particles are changing. So that's not the case. Usually, if you, if you, if, I wish I, I drew a color wheel for this, techno, uh, for this tutorial, but if you take a color wheel and you have a particle that absorbs a particular wavelength, right, it will, uh, 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 it, what you see is often on the opposite side of the color wheel. Um, maybe I should uh, demonstrate this with a sample that I brought today. So I have a little show and tell. Okay, so this sample is uh, of gold nanostars. Okay, and the nanostars will absorb in the blue. Okay, but they'll scatter orange, and you'll, that's very easy for you to see. So as I pass this around, just hold this up to the light, and you'll see that it extinguishes blue light. Okay, but if you then just hold it down at the table, right, it'll appear uh, a kind of a rusty orange. Okay, and so that's just simply how the light interacts with the particles. All right, so. So that's true for just about anything that scatters light, but gold particles and silver particles are particularly good at this. And so the things that we use to characterize these are the extinction coefficient. So for a given particle, the extinction coefficients can be very high. These are several orders higher than the strongest organic dyes. Okay, so it could be for 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 11th inverse molar per, per centimeter. Okay, and the things that we care about in terms of these uh, optical properties is that they have a large scattering cross section. Okay, and as the size of the particle increases, the extinction goes up, and these cross sections and uh, I guess the quantum yields of the scattering also increase. Okay. Um, there is also a composition aspect to this, that is the material depends, uh, influences what wavelength that the particles will absorb or scatter light. So uh, for silver, uh, which is uh, uh, not as popular as the uh, gold material, but for silver, this really spans the visible range, starting at 380, and then as a the particle goes up, you'll see that there's a shift toward longer wavelengths. Okay? And in the case of gold, uh, you start at 520, it's a little bit lower, and as the particle size goes up, you can go to 660 nanometer or actually into near infrared. Okay? So we'll see the different, we'll go over the different physical parameters that actually cause these wavelengths to shift. Okay? And the wavelength, of course, is very important as we try to couple this to imaging modalities. All right, um, just quickly, um, so we'll be mostly talking about single loose individual particles that are embedded in some dielectric medium. Okay, so that's our original picture. But there are other forms of surface plasmon. There's something known as a surface plasmon polariton, which is really the propagation of a, of a plasmon along a surface, right, which can then exit out several microns or many microns away from the place that you excited the plasma to begin with. Okay, this, this has to do with something called SPR, surface plasma resonance. It's not quite the same as what we're going to be talking about today, okay? but, but the basic phenomenon is, of course, they have a, a, a common bound. Okay? And there's also a hybrid of this. So for example, if you put nanoparticles in a chain, you can get both a propagation of the plasmons, as you see here, but in between the particles, you can also get an emission, a kind of a scattering. So uh, this gives rise to lots of interesting aspects of photonics, but again, that's a topic we're going to pass over today. Okay, so we're gonna just focus on the scattering properties of individual metal particles. Okay, so uh, I'll try to make this slide as digestible as possible. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the theoretical construct of how plasmons works. 
Okay, it really involves two, uh, uh, two simple equations. The first equation is known as the clausius mazotti equation. This is the definition of, of any sort of resonance scattering form. Okay, so alpha, this alpha term is the polarizability. That's the, the, the size of your scattering cross-section. And it's equal to this formula here where you have a dielectric function, okay, and that's defined by your particle, right? So uh, calibrated against the dielectric function of the medium that it's in. So if you're in water, epsilon d could be 1.33, uh, uh, or rather the, the, the square of 1.33, sorry, square root of 1.33. Okay. So the medium and the material right, have a certain matching in order to, uh, that influences the intensity of your, of your polarizability. The most important term though is here, right? To get the resonance function, you basically want to bring this as close to zero as possible. And since this is, a, this is an additive term, but what it means is that your dielectric function has to be negative, okay? And so metals generally can have a negative dielectric function in the visible wavelength, okay? So this is, uh, uh, so this is why particles are able to support a plasma mode. Now, the other thing about this term, this epsilon term, is that it's, it is a complex function. So you have a real term and a complex term, okay? And so for quantification of Denotes to establish what a plasma is. We, we generally think about the real term, but the imaginary term, the, co the complex portion, actually influences loss. And so, again, many particles, or many metals, rather, are ruled out because they have a large loss component. So silver and gold are among two of the few part materials that will have a relatively small uh, uh, imaginary component. And that allows you to be able to see uh, uh, and get uh, rather efficient plasma resonance. Okay? So, uh, the other part of, of plasma resonance involves something called the Drude, uh, the Drude model. Okay? And the Drude model is, is mathematically expressed this way. Okay? So here's the real component okay, where uh, you have a, a something defined as a plasma frequency divided by the dielectric function squared plus the plasma relaxation frequency. Okay? These terms don't have much impact on us for the rest of the talk, but, but this quantifies uh, uh, at least mathematically, how we can think about plasmons. Okay, it's the basic form uh, based on the Drude model. And this is the, uh, uh, the imaginary component. So we combine the clausius mazotti equation with the, Drude, with the Drude model, right? This is the ideal frequency that you should get out. Okay, so the plasmon resonance that we actually see and detect, right, is a function of the intrinsic plasma frequency of your material divided by some square root of your dielectric medium, okay? And so qualitatively, this is what you can use to sort of predict trends when you're seeing shifts in plasma resonance based on your particle, okay? Now, this is only based in theory, so experimentally, there's a lots of uh, perturbations to, to, the, to this idealized structure. Uh-oh, looks, like looks like my point is about to die out. Can I borrow yours, Steve? So, um, so, so we won't be using this to predict any kind of plasma resonance, but rather just uses a model for how plasmons can be seen in, in different kind of particles and also in the medium that they're in. Okay. Thank you. All right, so there's been a great deal of work, about a century's worth of work in calculating how plasmons can arrive. And, and the one that's most common is known as the, uh, uh, it's known as me theory, right? There, there's actually different forms of this and, and we won't need to go into the details. But the generalized me theory has successfully been able to model, to predict what sort of frequencies can come out based on the size and the matching of the metal particle and the, and the, and the material they're embedded in. Okay? And I find this very useful to help you get a sense of, of when a plasmon will uh, be useful for a, a, a particular imaging application. Okay? So it tells us lots of different trends. Okay? So first here on the right, this just shows plasmons as a function of different, uh, uh, different materials. So you have copper, silver, and gold, right? These are noble metals. And the, the curve in red is the imaginary component, right? This is known as the dielectric, uh, the optical conductivity. And if it's high, you won't get much of a plasmon resonance, right? And if it dips down lower, you can start to see a resonance. So copper actually does have a weak resonance right here around 620 to 700 nanometers. Okay, so, uh, so it can be used uh, for applications if one wished to, okay? But it's not as strong as some of the other materials. Okay, here's silver, right? And you can see that silver's dielectric function, uh, sorry, the, the loss function is much lower, and so you have a much stronger resonance relative to that of copper. And gold is kind of intermediate, right? You have some kind of resonance, but the dielectric, but the loss function actually extends out to the visible 
possible range. Okay? Now, as you shift this toward longer wavelengths, so here's a near IR range, right, then the loss function for gold becomes down, it goes down, and actually you can get quite strong resonances from gold. And we like this, of course, because gold is considered to be biocompatible for the most part. Right? Silver has some toxicity issues, so, so we really like to focus on gold. So using gold in the say 600 to 900 or 1,000 nanometer range is a very good match for doing a lot of biophotonic applications. Now, how do you shift the plasma resonance? Okay, so this, this graph here is a, a simulation of plasma resonance based on particles with different sizes. So here at 20 to 40 nanometers, this is considered a, the, the classic plasma uh, resonance regime, and you can see there's a strong band of 520. But as you increase the size of the particle, you'll notice that the band starts to shift and broaden out toward the visible range. Now, unfortunately, right, the near IR is somewhere out here, and you can see how broad these are getting. But we have several tricks that we can use to shift the plasma resonance out there without losing the uh, the structure of the of the of the resonance band. Yes. Uh, two questions. So here, regarding general, this is uh, this is random number of particles of all shapes and sizes. So for regarding shape, or no. Uh, Classic uh, me theory mm -hmm. uh, is for only for spheres. Well, a classic me theory can be the generalized me theory can be adapted for different shaped particles. In fact, so the and has been. Base functions for like functions to other functions. Oh, that's a question I, I'm not able to answer. I'm afraid, but uh, but I'll, I'll just simply say that uh, uh, people's comfort level with the generalized me theory is such that they could you could basically input any kind of structure and be able to calculate the plasma resonance frequencies of a particular structure. Sure. Right. Even coupled, the, the real challenge is coupling particles. You have two particles that come close to each other then it starts to get more difficult to, to model this correctly. But for an individual structure, uh, if, you know the, if you give it the right input parameters, the material, the size, dimensions, and the medium, uh, you can basically predict what the wavelengths, uh, what the plasma resonance bands are for that structure. Okay, so you had mentioned uh, um, um, shape and, and, uh, uh, and other parameters, and I, I would like to get to that. But first I have to talk about size. Okay, so, so uh, for the most part, any gold nanoparticle is plasma resonant, right? But having said that, their wavelength of excitation and also the strength of the resonance uh, can vary depending on their size. So small particles, let's say between two to five nanometers, they have a resonance, but it's rather broad. And these are not that useful for biophotonic applications per se because, uh, because there's a great deal of scattering due to the high surface area. The high surface area to volume actually minimizes, uh, uh, diminishes the strength of the plasma resonance that you can have. Plus there aren't a lot of electrons in smaller particles. The larger your particle, the more plasma, the more free electrons you have to, to increase the uh, extinction coefficient. So by the time you get about uh, uh, 10 nanometers, you start to have a very appreciable, strong uh, resonance band that can be, uh, that can be used. Okay? And then as you go from 10 to say 20 or 40, right, um, you're still in the classic regime, but then again, as you change the size of the particle, you can start to see this shifting and broadening. So why is that? So the shifting has to do with something known as phase retardation. Okay? So the electrons like to, in the given material, like to travel right, only so far before they encounter some sort of uh, uh, phonon, uh, as it would be called, and, and it can cause a scattering of the particle. So in the case of gold and silver, that's about 40 nanometers. If you have a 40 nanometer particle, the electrons can go from one edge to the other, right, and basically resonate without a great deal of, of perturbation. But as you increase the size of the particle, right, there's an effective slowing down of that motion, and that causes the, sh the frequency to be shifted. Right? So we just take a larger particle as, as drawn here, right, to go from this point to this point, right, actually takes longer than to say to go from, from here to here. Okay? So, so the fact that you can actually go from here to here or here to here right, gives you right, a, a broader range of frequencies that, that the electron mobility will uh, be characterized by. Okay? Now the other factor is known as a higher order plasma resonance. Okay? So, so far we've been talking about particle, or sorry, electrons that basically just go from pole to pole north to south, but, but as you get to larger particles, right, you can start to take shortcuts, right, which are more amenable to the mean free path of the electron. And that gives rise to new modes. So here at 100 nanometers, you can see that that's the dipolar band, right? So it's shifted quite a bit toward longer wavelength. And a new band starts to appear, and that's due to these shorter paths that are available to it, okay? And as you get to even larger particles, you can see a tripling of the bands, right? Here's one, two, three, right? And so the larger a structure you get, the longer the, uh, the more modes that you can have in here, okay? So you're, you can think of the particle as sort of a cavity in a box, and so the, but the electrons have a, a frequency range that they like to be in, defined by their mean free path. Okay, now 
Equally important in terms of influencing the, the wavelength of these particles is the medium that you embed them in. Okay, so we're going to be mostly in water. We don't have to think about things like uh, glass or titanium oxide or organic solvents. But just so that you're aware, right, if you increase the dielectric constant of the material that the particle is embedded in, you will get a shifting of the plasma on to longer and longer wavelengths. Okay? And so this is true whether the particle is embedded in some sort of solid material or in some sort of liquid. Okay? But since we're going to be working in water, uh, we don't have to worry about this too much. Okay, now the most important factor and the one that has had the most exciting developments in the last 15 to 20 years has been the effect of shape. On, on particle structure. Now, now this idea actually has been around for about a century, but it's only been recently that, that chemists had developed enough control to be able to change the shape of the particle. Okay, so one of the most popular forms of particles uh, that, uh, that people like to play with, uh, with uh, um, for, for these kind of applications have been the nanorods. Okay, and so the nanorods you can think of as a, an elongated sphere. Okay, there's been a symmetry breaking element to it where you, by, by causing this to be oblong, in structure, you now have two different modes. You have a, a you have a longitudinal mode that goes along the axis of the rod, and you have a transverse mode that goes up and down. Okay, so this gives rise, of course, to two different frequencies. And so you saw this in the in, in the previous talk by Dr. Bopart. But here, the transverse mode is in the region that you would expect most gold nanoparticles to resonate. But the longitudinal mode actually is very sensitive to to the length, right? And so the longer you make the rod, the more you can shift this toward the near infrared, okay? And, and so theory actually tells us that the ratio of the length to the width, the aspect ratio as it's called, uh, uh, impacts the position of the, the longitudinal surface plasma, okay? This one doesn't get impacted too much. It pretty much stays in the range of 520 to 510, right? But you can shift this one all the way into the near infrared region, okay? One, one of the people, uh, one of the persons that was uh, responsible for developing uh, uh, practical methods for synthesizing gold nanorods, the, the godmother of gold nanorods, is Catherine Murphy, who's at University of Illinois. So, so she and, and Mustafa El Sayed at Georgia Tech really deserve most of the credit in terms of defining how one can construct and be able to tune gold nanorods to give you the wavelength of interest. Okay? So notice here that as you're changing the aspect ratio, you have this quasi-linear relationship between the wavelength and the, uh, and, and the aspect ratio. Okay? It's, uh, it's empirical, but still very useful for us to, to be able to predict what we get out. Okay? So the wavelength of interest, of course, everyone knows now, right, is going to be this region between just off the visible region, uh, off the visible band, 7 to 50 nanometers, and about 1.3 microns, right, because this is your biological window. So if you have two nanoparticles that have a strong resonance in that window, then you can use them as contrast agents for various, uh, for, your, for your various imaging applications. Is there a question on this side first? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so for the importance of OCT, I, uh, I think an important question is like what uh, properties of coherence pre are, is preserved? Like if you just look at the gold nanoparticle, like just like a dipole approximation, you see how these uh, like the oscillations of the electrons. I know that the uh, emitted light, just so you look at it as a nano antenna, mm -hmm. well, like, uh, it'll be emitted at the same wavelength mm -hmm. as the uh, incoming light. Mm -hmm. But besides that, what you know, coherent properties of light are preserved? Is that known physically? Because for OCT, it's like a fundamental yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex question. The question is, is, you know, can you predict, you know, how efficient a particle is at producing either isotropic scattering or uh, uh, elastic scattering or, or other modes? Um, for the most part, you can, uh, it would be safe to say that resonance absorption scattering pretty much takes up 95% or more of the output from any plasma resin nanoparticle. So that's a safe assumption. Um, but there are variations and the, and the shape of the particle, of course, can cause things like depolarization. You can lose phase as a function of the structure. I'll show one example of that later in the talk. Okay. But you can presume that nanoparticles do provide a great deal of elastic absorption and scattering. Okay. So it loses coherence for the most part. Um, coherence is, uh, so, so if you talk about coherence, we really think about it in terms of scattering, right? So, so, so you don't lose any phase with elastic scattering, but there, is, there are mechanisms that allow you to modulate that phase. And so, so you'll see some examples of that. You might want to ask your question again at the end of the talk then. Okay, so this is just, uh, this is just a, um, um, a quick uh, survey sheet of 
different structures that have been made in the past uh, decade or so. So in addition to making rods, people have been successful making prisms, triangular particles, both on a surface and in solution. Um, this is a famous one, the nanoshells, where you have a, a thin gold coating on the, uh, uh, on, around the dielectric core, right? And the tuning of that, of course, has been calculated and, and, and the theory developed so that you can get these to have a broad resonance in the near infrared region, okay? There are these decahedral particles, which are really disc-shaped. Here's a cross-section of one of these. And again, there's an aspect ratio associated with this that allows you to shift it to near infrared if you have good control over the chemistry, okay? Uh, nanocages is sort of a variant on a nanoshell where you actually hollow them out and you replace whatever is in the inside with just, with just a dielectric medium itself. And, and lastly, here we have nanostars which are being passed around the room. So you can see that these are uh, uh, multi, uh, uh, multipodal nanoparticles, but really you can think of them as nano rods where the individual uh, spikes represents uh, a high aspect ratio part of the structure that can support near infrared uh, scattering. Okay, so lots of different structures are actually available. This is just a, uh, a nice sampling of some of the more popular ones that have come up in, in recent years. Okay, so, so with regard to using a nanoparticle, right, it's worthwhile to spend a few minutes to talk about the functionalization of those surfaces. Okay? And, and the key to working with nanoparticles, as anybody will tell you, is that not only do you have to make sure that the molecules are nicely attached, but you have to make sure that the nanoparticles are well dispersed in solution. Okay? And this is, a, this is a, a, a perennial problem. There is no one general solution to keeping a particle well dispersed in, uh, in a medium, uh, but uh, there are some general rules of thumb. Okay? And so the rules of, and, and the, the problems that you encounter, especially in, the, in an in vivo situation, is that you're trying to prevent nonspecific absorption, particularly proteins, from getting onto the particle. Because if you get proteins of different sorts on the particle, this can lead to their clearance in a biological system. Okay, so you're trying to avoid clearance in in vivo, right, at least unnecessary clearance, and you're also trying to avoid non-specific cell uptake, and both of those are very strongly modulated by the surface chemistry one does on any of these nanostructures. Okay, so the key uh, issues here is to prevent this sort of non-specific absorption, right, you also want to make sure you have good dispersion control, okay, which can be done either in a steric fashion or using some electrostatics. We'll see some examples of that. And of course, the strength of the chemistry attaching molecules to the surface. This turns out not to be as important as dispersion control and the non absorption, but, but all three are factors that still have to be taken into account when you're trying to functionalize your particle. Okay, so here we have four uh, categories of, of coding methodologies. Um, this is by far the easiest and most common one. Maybe not the most reliable one, but, but certainly one of the most common. And that's just simply to wrap materials around a nanoparticle without worrying too much about the surface chemistry. Okay? And then those who have a handle on chemistry can design ligands that can actually attach one end to the surface, right? followed by the design of a ligand off the surface that can maintain uh, good dispersion control or, or absorption. Okay? Uh, and then there are variants on this where once you attach a molecule or polymers on the surface, you can start to grow a, a, a shell that can lead to one or more properties, uh, enhance one or more properties of the particle in solution. Okay. Uh, this picture here is, uh, again, just a very basic one that describes what happens when, uh, the, the, this really emphasizes the importance of dispersion control. Okay, so, so before nanoparticles became a buzzword, right, there was this term called colloids, right, and colloids is a much older term, but in fact, nanoparticles are a subset of colloidal materials. And, and if you go back to the, the roots of the word colloid, it means it comes from the word glue, right, in Latin, to stick, and, and that's because particles are very sticky. Right? And so one of the ways that you keep particles from sticking to each other, keep them from aggregating, is to put on some sort of organic shell, a fuzzy shell, right, that, that keeps them away from each other. Okay? Um, so the size of the particle, as particles get larger, does increase their natural tendency to attract. Okay? This is known as the long-range van der Waals attraction. So this red curve here represents how nanoparticles tend to behave when they get in close proximity to each other. Okay? And to prevent them from actually touching and then remaining in, a, in, a, in an aggregated form, right, we develop these sort of surfactant shells which give you a high level of steric repulsion right, as the particles get close. So as you get close, the part of the, there's a sort of a compression, right, and that compression gives rise to a repulsive force. And so what you want in the end, right, at least theoretically, is you want what's called a secondary minimum where the particles don't get too close to each other. Right? This, is the, this is really as close as they would get. It makes them easy to separate out when you need to use them for dispersing a biological solution. Okay, so these methods of coding, I'll just, just uh, walk through these one by one. 
Okay. So for physisorptive coating, this is basically just adding a, a polymer, a polyelectrolyte onto the surface. Okay. And this is really an old technique. You can see back here, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a monograph that's dedicated to nanoparticle functionalization. You can absorb proteins or polyelectrolytes or uh, different kind of structures that have charge on them, right? In a rather nonspecific fashion, as portrayed in this, in this uh, illustration here, right? But if you are good at it, right? That is, if you, are, uh, if you have good hands, you can figure out ways that allow you to coat this in a way that provides a stable coating and can use them uh, without further ado. And most people, many people, I should say, don't like to worry about the surface chemistry, although it is important, but once they get a working system, they go off and study their, their uh, biophotonic application. Okay? Now, that, that's very understandable. Okay? But there are actually nice ways to do this. So given that you have a good starting point, you can, you can coat polymers around a nanoparticle surface, you can actually do this with some, kind of, with some degree of control. So if you take, for example, a positively charged polymer, right, that can form a pretty nice monolayer around a nanoparticle, and then you introduce a negatively charged polymer that introduces a second layer, and you can just alternate between positively charged and negatively charged polymers, and you can start to grow a layer of material on this. And of course, you can start to incorporate functionality associated with those polymers. Okay, so, so this has been uh, an, an offshoot of the classic, just simply mixing polymers in with, with nanoparticles. Okay, so um, there are multiple variations on this theme, but I'd like to get to the second part, which is right, having a little bit more uh, control in terms of designing how molecules are absorbed to the surface. Okay, since we're talking about gold, perhaps the most popular thought that comes to mind is to use sulfur in the uh, sulfur terminated structures, thiols, to form a monolayer on gold surfaces. And, and this is a practical approach, especially in a laboratory environment where you can get molecules to stick onto the surface. And then, of course, you can tailor right, the chemical properties of that thiol-dependent molecule with, uh, with, with perhaps some protein uh, anti fouling properties, such as a polyethylene glycol. Okay. And so, so the basic way to go about doing this is to at least the basic thinking that goes behind this is to create what's known as the monolayer protected gold cluster. Okay? And for small particles, let's say up to 10 nanometers or so, this works very well okay? and it's, it's highly reproducible. The problem is that as you get to larger particles, there are some problems associated with this. Part of it being that usually when you make a molecule, they tend to be much smaller than the nanoparticle itself. So there's a limit to how much you can tailor a structure to be able to design it for, a dispersion, uh, for, for good dispersion in a biological solution. Okay? So um, the most common approach, including one that we used in labs, is to take a PEG molecule that has a thiol on the surface and to attach that onto a gold particle. So now you have right, some anchoring with the sulfur and a long polymer chain that can be used to uh, repulse proteins. Okay? But, but here is a problem that occurs that if you start to work with biological medium is that when you have thiols on the surface, then they're usually things that can cause the thiols to be knocked off. Okay, so they're not really a permanent solution if you're thinking about doing this for, say, a multi-day experiment. Right? So things like cysteine glutathione, which are biogenic thiols, can be used to uh, 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 compromise your surface and introduce all sorts of defects. Okay, so, so this is a, a good quick entry into making particles that are functionalized, but uh, maybe also needs some more work. Yeah, I think there was a question at some point. No? Okay. Mm. I just wanted to know that if these, uh, these coatings with polymers or like, if they, from what I know, for certain levels, if they shift off the properties, right? If they shift the spectrum. Uh, yeah, so that's a dialect. So you can think of the, the molecule, the, the monolayer as a, as part of the, uh, dial the dielectric medium. And again, we'll see some examples of where you can see some very sensitive shifts due to due the molecule absorbing onto the metal surface. So, so that's a good point. Okay, um, this is again a variation on the theme of being able to stick molecules onto surfaces. So one of the things that is certainly important if you're gonna use a chemisorption approach is to have molecules that don't come off very easily. And so, so for example, instead of using thiols, right, uh, in, in my lab, we often use amines, right, which can then react with a molecule known as carbon disulfide, and it forms this bidentate anchor, which has a very nice purchase onto a gold surface, okay? But the general idea is the same, right? You can attach whatever molecules you like as long as you have a good purchase by, by some form of chemistry, okay? Usually these things don't take very much time to, uh, to, to optimize, um, but, but like all things, they take some practice. Okay, so as an example of, of how you apply right, chemisorptive 
uh, functionalization. So usually you want to cover your nanoparticle with something that is inert, like polyethylene glycol. But you also want to have on a, a small percentage of molecules that can be attracted toward particular targets. So, so at Purdue, we, we often like to use uh, uh, folate as a targeting ligand because many cancer cells express the folic acid receptor, which has very high affinity for single molecules of folate. And so, uh, so here's a gold particle, right, that's been functionalized with the folate and, you know, some dithylated anchor. And here's a, uh, here's a picture of, of cancer cells that, that overexpress the, the folate receptor. And, and here you can see the nanoparticles. This is a technique I'll talk about later known as TPL. But you can see the nanoparticles accumulating on the surface of the cell after a few hours. Okay, so, um, so the surface functionalization, of course, right, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is, an, is an essential step, right, in terms of being able to provide specificity for targeting your nanoparticles. Okay, um, I'm going to just pass through these quickly now. Okay, so, so again, right, once you have some sort of coating, you can continue to grow the coating on this, right? So there's a lot of polymer chemists who have gotten involved in being able to develop uh, uh, surface chemistry. So here's actually a very good example. It's a little bit older, but this example shows that you can use a technique known as emulsion polymerization to create uh, basically a plastic coating around a nanoparticle, right? And, and this is so robust that if you try to dissolve the particles with some sort of etchant like sodium chloride or, or cyanide, the particle will actually be able to resist these kind of fairly harsh chemical treatments. Okay. Um, it's hard to functionalize such structures sometimes, but you really can have this kind of degree of, of very tight control in terms of uh, providing chemical stability as well as some dispersion. Okay. So, so again, I'm going I'm to skip this last part, but, but it's just more chemistry about how to uh, uh, further modify the particle. Okay, so let's go to the second half of this, which is really to apply nanoparticles for various biophotonic applications. So, so half of what's done in the literature these days is not to put the nanoparticles in the biological system, but to use to use them for ex vivo sensing. Okay, so uh, bioanalytical chemists uh, have uh, taken advantage of the very strong light scattering pr produced by many these nanoparticles. Okay, so again. Recall that particles, as a function of size, can have uh, uh, can shift their 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 plasma resonance. So if you're 50 nanometers or less, right, you tend to have particles that that absorb or scatter in the green, right. But as you go to 80 to 100 nanometers, right, you see yellow and then finally orange, and that's the same color as the sample that was running around the that was running in the, around the room. Okay. So this gives you then some wavelength specificity in terms of tracking the particle, right. And so here's an early example, one that I think has been very popular. Um, if you're looking to you know, detect the specific DNA strands, you can have two particles of different sizes coated with two different kinds of DNAs. And so depending on the antisense complementary strand, right, you can hybridize one of the gold particles to the surface right, versus the other. So here's a case where you have two different kinds of particles, right, the green and the yellow, right, which are localized by two different strands of DNA. Right? So if you only have one type, then you have just the yellow or just the green. Okay? Very common practice, uh, um, very popular and easy to do for lots of people who have nothing more than just a simple optical microscope uh, with dark field condenser. Okay, now. There is, of course, more than just simply the wavelength of the nanoparticle that you can take advantage of. One that's sort of underappreciated is that the nanoparticle scattering increases with size. Okay? And so if you take a small particle and you cause it to aggregate because of some protein-protein interaction, right, the size of the particle increases effectively and that will cause the scattering to be much brighter. It's a much more efficient uh, and has a higher extinction coefficient of uh, interaction with, uh, with, with light. Okay? And so being able to detect something based on amplitude changes is also can be useful for lots of applications and of course there's a combination of these two as you as you aggregate the particles this will also effectively cause the size change to cause the plasma resonance to shift so you can get a, both a frequency shift as well as an increase in the scattering amplitude okay? and, and people have taken advantage of this not just for looking at them directly but even for using uh, 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 fairly standard technology like dynamic light scattering to look at changes in the size of the particle as a function of the interaction between them mediated by the surface chemistry. Okay. Now, 
because particles, when they aggregate, change their color, right, this makes it, again, very easy for many people to be able to follow. So, so again, if you introduce an analytes, right, you can cause this wavelength shift, right, very easy to see with your own eye, a spot test, as it were, okay. And so here's one example that involved uh, carbohydrates, right, somebody has functionalized a particle with ligands that express different kind of carbohydrate structures, and these are used to attract a, a protein, uh, a carbohydrate recognizing protein known as a lectin. And so, uh, not too easy to see in this screen, but, but you can see that there's a, a change in coloration as these lectins are introduced. So, right, just gives you this instant gratification of being able to see a shift in the plasma resonance as a, as a function of the analyte that's introduced. Okay. So again, the advantage for doing this kind of work is that it's, it's, it's easy to do. Um, it's harder to quantify though. So, um, so if you're looking for some sort of threshold in terms of detection, right, this is a really kind of a low tech approach that, that people can take advantage of just because of plasma resins, uh, the, the properties of plasma resins between particles when they're in close proximity to each other, right? So this particle coupling can be used to, uh, to uh, cause all sorts of nice wavelength shifts, right? And those, of course, can be directly applied toward imaging as well. Okay, so this touches down on the question that was uh, raised earlier. So how about detecting molecules as they bond to the metal particle itself? And so this can actually be exquisitely sensitive uh, if you have the right shape and size of the particle. Okay. So depending on the, the structure, so here's an example, I have a sphere, a uh, triangular prism, and a nanorod, right? When molecules bind to the surface of these particles, you can cause their plasma resonance shift because of this local, di uh, local media change. So even though you're working in water, right, because you're having say organic molecules that come down to the surface, that effectively causes the particle to be in a higher dielectric function. And you can actually see a, sh a resonance shift in some cases, um, but by lots, this is a 40 nanometer shift just by a monolayer of molecules coating on a surface. Okay? And you can plot this as a, function of the, uh, as a function of the concentration of molecules. The more it is a trop of the structure, so the nanorod is very sensitive to shifts in plasma resonance, whereas a spherical particle maybe isn't terribly, isn't terribly sensitive. So here's, here you can see the slope of this. It's, you, know, you can see changes as a function of molecules attached to the surface, but the nanorods actually will shift even more. And now people have actually optimized such systems that you can get uh, what are known as RIU shifts of thousands of nanometers per RIU index. Okay, so, so this becomes now the, perhaps the, the leading approach for chemical sensing based on plasma resonance, right? So, so by having a, a tailor designed nanoparticle, you can influence its wavelength of resonance by sh simply shifting the, what's on the surface. Okay, so there have been applications of this, not just for look, detecting molecules, but, but uh, also being able to apply this in a, in a, in a, in a biophotonic setting. Okay, so, so taking, going back to the gold nanorod example, okay, so I've mentioned before that as you change the aspect ratio of the gold nanorod, right, you can cause it to resonate in different wavelengths, okay? And again, sorry, but there, there are three bands here that you should be able to see in your handout, okay? These three bands, or I should point up here, these three bands correspond to three different types of gold nanorods with different aspect ratios, okay? So this is the longest one, right? This is the one that has the highest aspect ratio, and this is the one that has the shortest, okay? And these gold nanorods are functionalized such that they have an antibody at the ends of, at the termini of the gold nanorod. So when they're introduced into the corresponding antigen, you can see a shift of individual bands, right, that will tell you which nanoparticle can be correlated which which antigen, okay? So, so this leads now to a multiplex capability, uh, at least in, a, in, a, in an ex vivo setting, okay? Uh, similar things have been done using, using these kind of uh, bipyramidal structures, but again, just really, uh, uh, tailors to the, the, the high degree sensitivity of what happens on the surface of these, these uh, broad shaped or, or uh, anisotropic nanostructures. All of this can be applied toward in vitro and in vivo settings, right? It's just a matter of finding the right system that allows you to couple the specificity, molecular specificity, with the, uh, the variability that you often encounter in biological systems. Okay. Um, this leads me to another uh, important topic. This one actually has been successfully applied toward uh, in vivo imaging. Okay? So, so again, the question was raised that if you shine a light on a particle, right, you know, how much of that uh, is emitted in that same wavelength? Okay? And so the answer is most of the time, right, you just get a standard scattering. But you can, in fact, get different kind of optical emissions. Okay? So by an emission, I'm going to just generalize this. An emission can be scattering or it can be fluorescence, right? but, but you're, you have a, a photonic output right, that can be enhanced or not 
by the structure, the, the nature of the gold particle underneath it. Right? This is a, a, a near field map of what these things often look like. This is basically the, the, the simulated version of a plasmon resonance, right? If you shine a light so that the so that the K vector is going this way, that's the direction of propagation, and the electric field is is polarized along the y-axis, right? You excite electrons so that you get what is known as a um, a, a gelium uh, uh, model, right? It's basically a, it's an evanescence field, a near field of electrons on the outside of the gold particle. Okay? If, if the light's traveling this way, then the electrons will resonate in a horizontal fashion. Okay, so that's known as a local field factor, an electromagnetic field factor. In a spherical particle, it only extends by a few nanometers. Okay, so so that's what makes it so sensitive. When a molecule attaches to the surface, right, you're actually influencing right the resonance frequencies at which these field factors will be generated. Okay. The larger, the longer, the more anisotropic the particle, right, the more these field factors can be extended. But perhaps one of the, the best parts about being able to use field factors is when you bring particles close to each other. Okay? So this isn't particularly strong. The, the units here are in, are in single digits. This goes from one to five. There's five times as strong a field here as there is, say, just on, on this part of the molecule here. Right? But if you bring two particles close to each other and there's a very small gap, as a function of the diameter of the particle, you can actually create a very strong uh, a captive field, a cavity, that also corresponds to plasma resonance. Now, this is a little bit different than thinking about single particles. Here is a single particle that's responsible for right, that sort of uh, butterfly, uh, butterfly mode. But if you bring two particles close to each other, there's a coupling between their plasma resonances that causes a strong field in between. Okay? And so this allows you to detect things that fall into the cavity Right? And actually the fields that are generated by this method are much higher than that of single particles. So there's been a lots of interest to actually bring together pairs or sets of particles that can be used to generate these nanometer sized cavities between two metal surfaces for the sake of increasing these plasma enhanced emissions. Okay. So what are some of these emissions? So, so one of them, a uh, famous one now, is known as surface enhanced Raman scattering. Okay, so the abbreviation SIRS. I think probably just about everyone's encountered the term SIRS here. Okay, so SIRS is scattering, okay, but it's, it's inelastic. That is that there is a there's a wavelength shift, a Stokes shift in terms of the emission. And furthermore, uh, because it's a, a it's Raman scattering, this tends to be spectroscopic. So rather than having a single wavelength shift, you actually have Right, a spectroscopic fingerprint corresponding to whatever is in the proximity of the nanoparticle. So this has really attracted lots of attention from people who are interested in applying biophotonics and, and spectroscopy together. You can get a spectra of a molecule that's embedded on a nanostructure that can produce a high SIR signal. Right? How do you do this? How do you couple the molecular Raman signals right, to the plasma resonance or the, the coupled plasma resonances within a nanostructure? Okay, so, so the jury is still out on this. There, there are people who purposely put a molecule in between structures to be able to generate a high source signal. There are people who try to detect molecules that actually fall into the crevices, um, but uh, there is no yet one perfect method for doing this. If you're interested in something like SIRS, this is one of these higher opportunities that still kind of beckons. Many people have tried, and there's been a number of successes, but also a number of limitations. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a tricky area, but, but one that has continued to excite a lot of people in terms of the potential. Right? So, so the, the key to any kind of SIRS detection is that when you have a particle, or, or say an array of particles, is that you generate these so-called hotspots. Okay? So that is the same as this sort of strong field intensity, say, in between particles here, right? If you can generate a very small, intense hotspot, right, you should be able to actually bring out the detection of a molecule down to the single molecule limit, right? And that is what many people are after, right? But how do you do this in a reproducible fashion? So there are different kinds of designs. This is actually one of my favorite uh, examples. Um, this is a, a, a hollowed out sphere which has multiple layers. It's, it's a gold sphere right, that actually has a hollow interior right, that's crescent shaped. And it also contains a magnetic component so you can orient the particle. Right? We really have this interest in combining magnetic and, and plasmonics together. But the key about this structure is that the way that it was designed is that you have a rim here which is rather sharp. Right? And because the gold on the inside and the outside come to, come to a point, you can actually have a very strong field intensity right there on the edges 
of this kind of structure, right? So if you functionalize this with antibodies, you're able to detect things like sort of signals of molecules that bind to that center, okay? This is one of many, many different examples, but I think it's a very cool example. Okay? But this is still not as strong as being able to detect molecules that are in between particles. If you get particles that can assemble, hopefully reversibly, and bring them very close, then you can actually detect with much stronger fields, right, a, part of a molecule that is in between two particles, right, or a field of particles like this. Okay, so there's lots of ideas about how one can generate hot spots in these structures and also to couple them for, for biological imaging. Okay, so uh, I think everyone knows what fluorescence is and, uh, and plasmons can be used to enhance fluorescence, but not quite as much as it can be used to enhance Raman signals. So, so, so Raman scattering is considered to be a, a weak uh, emission, right? Usually, it's uh, you need a lot of material to see it, but but plasmons can raise the uh, the, the Raman scattering cross section by you know by a million fold or even more, depending on the uh, various factors. Fluorescence can also be enhanced by plasmons, but maybe to the tune of say 20 to 30 times. Okay, and it's a uh, it's a distance dependent effect. You can't put the molecule directly on the metal surface because what will happen is that if you excite the fluorescent molecule, there'll be an electron transfer that quenches that fluorescence, okay? But you want the molecule to be close to the field so that if you just raise it a few nanometers above, right, you don't have the electron transfer, at least not so much, but you have a field that comes out and that field can enhance the, the, the photonic output, okay? So, so people have played around with this and they've been able to increase uh, uh, fluorescence by a factor of somewhere between 10 to 100, uh, generally speaking. Okay? And this has obvious applications, right? You can look for the direct fluorescence emission itself. You can start to couple into some of these really cool technologies like, like fluorescence lifetime imaging. I don't know if that's been mentioned yet in this workshop, but a uh, very nice way to, 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 uh, to study uh, biomolecular interactions. Uh, you can even use it for fluorescence, uh, for, uh, for resonance energy transfer, okay? So resonance energy transfer, I think, is, again, somebody else's topic, but, but if you have a metal core, you can actually devise ways that you can enhance the output for a fluorescence energy transfer uh, type of situation. So, so you have a material on the inside that can couple to a molecule that binds to the outside and be able to see a stronger signal. Okay, so, so scattering is mostly what gold nanoparticles and their congeners are known for, but, but fluorescence output actually can also be, uh, um, has a, a, a good deal of opportunities. Okay. This is still really in its infancy, I would say. There's much more work to be done. So, so people who are interested in creating designer particles for contrast agents, right, might well consider some of these uh, plasma enhanced emission technologies. Okay, so I think I have just a few more minutes left, and so, so here's my opportunity to really couple this now to the main part of our, uh, of our workshop, which is to really uh, show how nanoparticles are used for biological imaging. Okay, so one of the easiest ways, again, is to use scattering, right? So to cut down on the total number of variables that you have in front of you, right? You, you stick with, you do the easy things first. And so, so dark field scattering can be used for uh, and, and of course, OCT can be used for, for being able to detect uh, the direct emissions from particles uh, based on that. Now, there's an issue of coherence that was mentioned, and so here I want to uh, raise an interesting point. If you change the shape of the particle, right, you can actually change how the light is emitted and vary the phase. So usually it's a spherical particle. Um, the phase of light going in is the same as that coming out. It's completely elastic, okay, and, 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 uh, and there's no change in the signal. But if you have something that is elongated or has multiple uh, aberrations to it, you can do some form of depolarization. So, you know, if you take two polarizer plates and put it 90 degrees, right, in principle you should not get light coming out through the, uh, after crossing both planes. But if you put particles like this in between, right, this can cause a significant depolarization of the light and allow for some leakage, okay? This gives rise to some very nice opportunities for being able to uh, uh, increase the quality of your signal, right, in the presence of a strong background. So, so here this has a specific depolarization function that allows you to raise the signal that uh, uh, counter to some cellular or, or tissue-like materials. Okay, so here's just an example of this cross-polarization method of detection. It's a different spectroscopy, right? So uh, if, you, if you take an image that just looks like this, right, this is a linear polarization, you can see structures that have particles and no particles, but then you apply a second polarization filter, right, then only those that contain these uh, oblong-shaped nanoparticles will be detected. Okay, so anytime you can incorporate some sort of filtering aspect, right, you of course can improve the quality of your imaging for um, uh, for that particular system. Uh, particles and, and probably you know just depending on the size 
you'll, you'll get the same intensity but at a different angle. I mean, you, you'll just change the phase function. Well, spherical particles are, again, it, it depends on the size of the spherical particle. So if we, if we define spherical particles as being on the order of 50 nanometers or so, you basically will not get much of a change in phase. But if you start to change the size of the particle so that you introduce some multimodal effects, then yes, right, depolarization starts to become a little bit more significant. But for the most part, right, you can change the depolarization much more dramatically by changing the shape of the particle. So that's really the emphasis I should place. It's one thing I forgot to mention throughout this, the course of this uh, tutorial, and that is that if you're going to develop a contrast agent for biological imaging, you don't want particles that are too big. Okay? So working with particles that are above, say, much above 100 nanometers gives rise to all sorts of problems. Right? So in a biological system, you'll have problems with clearance, for example. But it's also hard to stabilize particles that are much above 100 nanometers. Okay? And the optical properties, you don't gain that much more out of it just by changing the size. So really the issue here is to change the the, the, the finer shape of the particle to be able to pull out wave integer interest and also properties such as this, this depolarization. Okay. This, this polarization sensitivity is actually something that's really useful. Um, oh, and so, so, so this gives rise to an example you've, you've already seen. Okay. So when you have arms, like in a nanorod or a nanostar, right, you can actually modulate the scattering amplitude if you use a polarization plane. Right? So, so here's an example where we had the nanostar with a magnetic core in the middle. Right? If, you, if you apply a rotating magnetic field gradient, like the kind you find on a stir plate, you can get these arms to be aligned with the polarization plane so that you get a maximum scattering right, uh, twice per rotation. Okay? So once at 12 o'clock and then once again at 6 o'clock. And, and this gives rise to sinusoidal type of signal Right, that's akin to what Dr. Bopart described before as blinking. Right? So you have a blinking or a twinkling of signals that come from individual particles, which then right, give you a signal that you can easily apply to simple signal processing methods like Fourier transform. So here you can see how strong the signal is, right, where we've basically wiped out or deleted, rather, uh, much of the background signal right, and left this to have a high signal noise, whereas the original data, of course, is much greenier. Right? And, and here's an example of that imaging. So these are two nanostars. Well, this is one nanostar inside of, uh, that's been embedded in a, in a, in a, in a tissue-like environment uh, with low lighting contrast. You can actually barely see it. And here's a brighter object that, that is uh, immobilized uh, inside the very close proximity to the nanostar. So applying a rotating field gradient, this, uh, the star can, can spin around, right? And you'll, if you watch a movie of it, you'll actually see a fluctuation of that signal. It's very modest to our own eyes, but by applying Fourier transform, this is the Fourier domain imaging, of, right? Frequency selective image of that structure. So this nanostar that can rotate actually is much the brightest thing now in this image, whereas this very bright object, because it's immobilized and has an invariant scattering, right, is completely suppressed. Okay, so this sort of design element right, to generate what we call dynamic contrast is probably one that has a good deal of growth potential, especially when you try to couple it with complex uh, materials such as tissues for, for imaging applications. Okay. Um, there's a real need for this. It's more than just simply that it's fun to do. It's fun to make nanoparticles that have designer properties, but there is actually a, uh, an urgent need. Okay? And, and so one of them has to do exactly with, with these recent examples that you've already seen. This is the uh, OCT, spectroscopic OCT imaging that was produced by uh, Amy Oldenburg, where she used gold nanorods. You can see some kind of contrast here, right? And it's successful in terms of being able to detect nanoparticles in, in a complex environment. But uh, but the, the, the bad news, I, I guess, is that the, there's a very high loading of gold nanoparticles in here. In order to detect a, a significant uh, uh, signal background ratio, you have to actually load in hundreds of parts per million of gold. So, so clinically, this may not be as relevant as just being able to load in a few parts per million of gold. Here's another example involving photoacoustic tomography. Right? So this is light going in sound waves coming out. Okay, it's very powerful technology. They use gold nanorods injected into a mouse whose contours are just shown here. There's the signal, but again, it's a very high loading of gold nanorods that are required in order to get significant contrast. So, so one of the things you need to be able to do if you continue this field is not just simply have a nanoparticle that provides a static contrast where you have some improvement, some, some incremental improvement in your scattering, but also one that can be modulated right, by various uh, methods. So the mechanical methods, such as magnetomotive imaging is one. Uh, there's an all-photonic method where you can actually change uh, fluorescent stage from dark to light. Anything that you can use to, to, uh, to regularly modulate a signal can be applied uh, with uh, great benefits for imaging inside of tissues. Okay, so, so that's one of the selling points uh, right now that we'd like to be able to push for, push on.
Here's an example of that SIRS uh, methodology as I was mentioned before. So, so in this case, they're not trying to detect individual molecules coming to the nanostructure, but rather they actually put on tags, right? So, that, so this Raman tag produces a very strong uh, SIRS signal from within the, from within the animal. It, it's, it's competitive with fluorescence imaging. So this is one of the reasons why it's so exciting is that you can put in materials where you don't need to have the uh, you don't need to have the, the, the infrastructure for doing fluorescence detection, but rather you can use this based on scattering alone. Okay, so so uh, this really takes a lot of work to, to get it to work well, but, but it's very exciting to me to know that you can actually do Raman imaging inside of, a, inside of an animal like, like this, uh, uh, this new tumor mouse model here. Okay, so, so again, these signals are due to something that we've impregnated inside of the gold nanostructures, but uh, can be used also for uh, 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 in correlation with changes, dynamic changes that go on with inside of cells. So, so the idea of coupling spectroscopy with some of these uh, uh, signal enhancement uh, factors um, is, uh, I think, a, a very fruitful area of research. Okay, um, this, this is a cool example where you're actually seeing changes on the cell surface. So um, I think most of you know that uh, uh, if you have any sort of interaction with signaling molecules to membrane proteins, one of the things that commonly occurs is that there's a dimerization or clustering of the receptor before a signal transduction can occur. But it's hard to image such things. You know, people have tried to uh, couple this with, with different kind of fluorescent molecules, but it's not always easy to catch. But here's an example where you take two gold nanoparticles and there's a signaling event, right? Then you bring them proximity. Again, the coupling between the particles gives rise to a stronger source signal. So it's another application of being able to use this plasmon enhanced emission for detecting uh, uh, different kind of structures. Okay. Um, this last part, and I think I'd better wrap up after this and, and just leave some of the uh, other applications uh, for your own reading, uh, is to uh, couple plasmon resin materials with multi-photon excitation. So, um, so pulse laser spectroscopy or pulse laser, uh, uh, pulse laser confocal imaging has really become extraordinarily powerful and important. And, and it turns out that plasmon resonances can be coupled very nicely to uh, near-infrared uh, 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 laser pulses. So, so here's an example that, that we published a few years ago. Um, the gold nanorods have a resonance around 800 nanometers. Okay? And if you couple this to a uh, femtosecond pulse laser, you can actually uh, increase the photon density around the nanoparticles so you can absorb two photons at once. And so instead of just simply having a scattering event, what you're doing instead is that you're, you're ejecting electron from the valence band up to the conduction band. Okay? So you're creating a photo excited state. And in that case, right, then, uh, then what happens in the, in the next stage is after a few uh, nanoseconds or so, you get a, uh, a relaxation followed by a whole electron recombination, and this gives rise to an emission. This is plasmon enhanced because the photon absorption couples in with the plasmon band. So you can absorb two photons, the two photon absorption cross section of gold nanorods is much higher thanks to it, uh, thanks to thanks to the ability to tune the plasmon resonance as a function of shape. Okay. And this again is a polarization, polarization sensitive feature. So, so I have a movie here where you can see individual nano rods that are scattered on a glass slide. And, and uh, I, I've circled two spots, one and two. Number one, you can see where the nano rod is, but in number two, you, you can't see too much. Okay. But in fact, there's a nano rod there, it's just that it's aligned uh, perpendicularly with respect to the polarization plane. So if I play this movie where we're going to change the polarization plane every few degrees per frame, right, you can see that these nano nanorods again appear to be blinking, right? But this is really a function of changing the polarization plane. So this one is turning on and off, right? Out, uh, 90 degrees out of phase of this one here, which is underneath spot two, okay? So from that, we, uh, we back calculate, you know, what the original orientations are. So spot one contained a nanorod that's vertical, spot two is horizontal. So this speaks to the polarization sensitive absorption of structures like these anisotropic nanorods for being able to induce these uh, um, the stimulated emission. Okay. Um, I don't have to tell you that, that, that multi-photon imaging is, is great. I mean, the, the signal background uh, for this is extremely low. So here you're looking again at gold nanorods inside of cells. Okay. Uh, this is a transmission overlay of the, of the two-photon luminescent signal against, uh, uh, against a tumor cell. And, and you can, here's, here's a line scan. You can see that signals of single gold rods like this one here are well in the hundreds to one ratio. Okay. So it's, it's, a, terrific, it's a terrific technique. It can even be done in vivo. Um, this has been been published a few years ago. But being able to detect particles as they're flowing through a blood vessel of a uh, near the surface.
surface of the skin is, is possible using this technique. Okay, so, so in vivo imaging for, for detecting multi-photon imaging uh, is something I think uh, also a wave of the future. Okay. I think I'm going to stop here. This last part is to just mention the fact that right, in addition to being able to generate photonic signals, when you shine light on a nanoparticle, one of the things that is for sure to happen is that they will get hot. So, so nanorods are very good at absorbing light, right? And sometimes you get a, a strong scattering. But depending on the size and the shape, you can also generate a good deal of heat, right? So non-photonic relaxation. And that, of course, couples into some therapeutic possibilities. So if you take a plasma resistant nanoparticle close to a diseased tissue and you shine light, you can image it, and at the same time you can start to see, uh, you can start to heat up the local environment and be able to do some control level of damage to the diseased tissue while leaving the rest of the particles alone. Okay, so this is just a quick example of one that we've done where nanoparticles were actually targeted to the tumor membrane. So you can see the nanoparticles on the cell membrane by this TPL te uh, technique, right? And then by shining a, a fairly weak power of, uh, of, of uh, fairly fairly weak laser power, we can actually induce a blebbing and you can see this uh, staining of the cell after the blebbing to show right, uh, 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 a rapid photothermal destruction. Okay. This, um, this destruction is uh, really based on uh, a number of events. It's not just simply overheating the cells, it turns out, but what we're doing is we're, by heating the golden nanorods in the, on the membrane, you're puncturing holes in the cell and that actually allows for a, a disruption of the homeostasis. You're changing the chemical, uh, you're, you're changing the, the uh, um, the, the intracellular calcium concentration in this case. This gives rise to this blebbing that you're seeing here in the movie. It's not generating steam bubbles as uh, one might think from the beginning, but you're actually just, uh, you're compromising the cell membrane and that leads to downstream effects uh, resulting eventually in the, in the death of the cell. Okay, I'm gonna stop here and um, thank you for your time. I think I've gone over a little bit, but I'd be happy to take any questions if you still have any. But uh, um, thank you again for letting me participate in your, uh, in your workshop. The slide we have the surface uh, and enhance the field. Right? We have two uh, spheres and show how the enhancement of the field is much ah. greater between two spheres. Sure. To just one single. Yeah, so this is, this, is a, this is a computer simulation, but it's one that just about everyone agrees with right now. This one? Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, this I'm, I'm a little bit confused because from a single gold metal particle, uh, Simulations show from gold metal particles, so we look at simulations, mm -hmm. factors of field enhancement uh, are of the order of 10 to the 12. Yeah. And these and experimental measurements show that factors of enhancement of the field order between 10, 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9. So you already showed here a factor of like 5 here. Well, the same time you show here factors of 10 to 6 between 2 uh, particles. Okay. But if you were to think, okay, you have two particles are close together. Here. All you have is, is, is the uh, simplification principle of the two fields. So you have something like the order of 10 to the 9 plus 10 to the 9, that's 2 10 to the 9, so field enhancement, but because they're close together, it's fact like a factor of 2. Well, that's not quite correct. Okay, so so first of all, when you talk about individual particle, the field factor, which is you know defined as e over e zero, uh, can be increased by say factors of ten to twenty, maybe you know in special cases up to about a hundred. But usually, you don't go much above single digits. In fact, for a spherical particle, elongated particles, you can go higher. Okay. Now, what are you seeing here is a little bit, hold on, what you're seeing here is a little bit different from what we're seeing here, and I didn't make that clear because of uh, time limitation. Okay, the SIRS effect, right, is actually E over E naught to the fourth power. Okay, so it, you're squaring both the instant light and also the emitted light. So it's, a, um, so it's more complicated than just looking at a simple uh, EM factor here. Okay, so, so these values are actually already right, raised to the fourth power of what you're having. Okay, but having said that, if you just, if you compare uh, the single exponent of this versus this, you actually do get an enhancement on the order of, I'd say about an order of magnitude or more. Okay, so between one to two order of magnitude can be, uh, and field factor enhancement can be created by the coupling of two particles. Now, the explanation for this is a little bit tricky, okay, and probably not one that I should drill, you know, uh, uh, go home to this audience, but, but the, uh, 
um, but there's a resonance factor that now corresponds to how the particles are spaced. It's not just simply bringing them closer, you know, it gives you a stronger field. There's actually a wavelength selection that corresponds to how particles are coupled, right? In addition to, in addition to uh, uh, being able to uh, tune them according to the material. So, so that's something we're gonna have to talk about offline. Yeah, they, they interact back and forth, I guess. Would yeah, like there, there's, more, there's, more, there's additional parameters that come into play when you start talking about what's called a collective plus one resonance. Right. Yeah. So it's a very interesting area of research, right? And it's been, it's actually it's been applied in, in a number of good ways, but, um, uh, but very different from looking at a single particle. Okay, so I'll just leave it at that. The organic shell or the gold shell? Which one? The organic shell. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, um, you know, for a practical consideration, if you functionalize a particle, right, how long lived can you expect it to be in a biological solution? And, and the answer really lies in, right, of course, the, the details of the materials put on here. So if you're thinking about the displacement of molecules that are attached, say, by, by sulfur ligands, then, then the displacement can be on the order of about a week, right, before you get a extensive degradation. So uh, most of the time you generate something within the first couple of days and then you use it. Um, if it's a polymer coated structure, right, there's entanglement of chains that actually leads to a, a self-stabilization. You can also further cross-link that. And those can go around a bit longer. The, the, but the more important trade-off that people uh, have to deal with is not so much the, the, the lifetime inside of a biological system, but how stable you make a structure versus its ability to be dispersed in solution. So, so the bigger problem tends to be how do you keep a particle from aggregating once it gets inside the body. This is a, this is a huge problem actually. Um, one that's partially solved by putting on the right coating, but there's numerous other factors that get involved in terms of being able to avoid, say, macrophage uptake, which we saw earlier today. Okay, so, so the chemical degradation isn't the biggest problem. How about that for, for an answer? Uh, going to the cell. Oh, okay. How many nanoparticles can go into a cell? This is always a tough question. Okay, so um, so in terms of the dynamic range, it's been shown uh, quite recently that someone has been able to put in over a million nanorods inside of a single cell. I mean, the nano. The, if you took saw the picture of the cell, it basically looks like a flashlight. And of course, you know, uh, depending on the amount of time that you you incubate cells and gold nanoparticles with, you, you could be able to limit this down to just a few. And that actually is the area that we're most interested in. But, uh, but typically speaking, if you, uh, um, for, for any given system, it's easy to get several hundred to several thousand nanoparticles inside of a cell, uh, either in a targeted or some sort of an induced uptake fashion. Is that correct? You said that the physical absorption, you're not considering the surface chemistry. But isn't that intrinsically important every time you try to put something on the side? Yeah, it's, 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 an acad it's an academic argument, actually. So, so, if you, uh, so I'm a scientist and I work with engineers. And we often get into these sort of discussions of what's important to do. So from a design principle, you want to know as much about the surface chemistry as you can, right? With the thought that you're going to solve the problem before it occurs, okay? But if you, if you reverse engineer it, right? You all, if all you really need is a particle that's sufficiently stable, right? Whatever technique you use to get there, it's going to be good enough as long as it's reproducible. So physisorption is one of those areas where, right? If you just play around with it enough, you can get something that is pretty reproducible, even if you don't fully understand it. Okay. I hate to, I hate to be on the side of the people who do that kind of work because I like to control things at the surface. But I have to admit there's certain practicality. So it all depends what you want to focus on. So right now the field is in the area where, as long as you have stable particles, you can target them and you don't get, you know, bad biological side reactions. Right, that's good enough. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What is the distance dependence? Is this that when you get fluorescence and when you get Right, okay. So the question uh, goes back to this uh, uh, fluorescence enhancement. Um, and again, this is not an easy question to answer. It actually has been looked at by uh, uh, quite a few years ago in a, 
in a model system where they had a surface and they just varied the distance of the molecule from that surface incrementally. Um, there are basically two rate laws, right? So one of them is the rate law of, of back electron transfer. So if a molecule is on the surface, that rate of electron transfer goes to, it's, it's pretty much exponential if I recall correctly. But the surface enhancement, the, the, the field emission, go back to the picture that has some fields on it. So right, the field can extend out by a few nanometers, right? And so that corresponds to, if I remember correctly, something like a to the power of three or inverse power of three. So, uh, and of course, there's also some finer details about whether you have a resonance coupling between the molecule and the, and the metal that it's embedded on. But more or less, if I can just give you broad numbers, I would say starting about three nanometers, you're already in the regime where you're, uh, you're enhancing the signal uh, uh, over some negative back electron transfer. Okay? Once you're about 10 nanometers, then your signal, your resonance, uh, your plasma enhancement starts to die off considerably. Okay? But if you design a system that's like this or, or like this, right, where you have a, a, a cavity that has a strong field in the middle, then of course you can play around with that much more. That hasn't really been explored very carefully. Most of it has been done on, on single particle surfaces. Thank you.